I'm very happy to be here at Kernel Recipes, and uh, since everyone likes to explain how they got here, I think I should describe how I got here, because it's kind of interesting. So last year, Jesper and a lot of other people who had been to Kernel Recipes said, Dave, you really got to go. It's like the best conference. You got to go. And so I was uh, tweeted an invitation from the organizers, and for one reason or another, I had a schedule conflict or whatever, I couldn't attend, so I said, I'm very sorry, I can't go, but thank you very much for the uh, invitation. And uh, the response I got back was, oh, that makes me very sad, we're so sad to hear this, and I proceeded to get bombed with sad cat pictures on Twitter for the rest of the day. My Twitter feed was completely unusable that day, so I said, oh. So this year I got invited again. I said, I better say yes this time. <laughs> so I said, yes, I'm so happy. I happen to be in Europe anyways for going to Lisbon for plumbers. I will be at Colonel Recipes. And God damn it, you better give me as many happy cat pictures as you gave me sad pictures last time. And he did. And once again, my Twitter feed was unusable. <laughs> so here I am. Um, I have a very what I think is a straightforward and simple point I'd like to make. I don't think I'll take the entire time slide up, and what that's awesome because I'm the kernel networking maintainer. You can ask me about anything. Networking, uh, developer workflows for large subsystems, uh, maybe things about my personal life within reason, things like that. But what I want to talk about is BPF as a technology is not just cool new thing that we can do interesting stuff with. It's actually in some way essential for keeping the Linux kernel relevant from this point forward. Development process has changed significantly from when I first got involved. Um, so let me give you some context. Um, who remembers the kernel lock? The kernel lock. Yeah, the big kernel lock. Who remembers that? So yes, so Linux didn't always have SMP support. We had to actually add it at some point. The way that we did it initially is that every path into the kernel would first take this global kernel lock and then release it when it went back into user space or whatever. And of course, there are complications with interrupts and whatever. But contextually, we're in Anaheim with me, Rusty Russell, Alan Cox, Linus, and we're sitting at a table at a restaurant, and we designed the kernel lock. And I wrote the initial implementation on a napkin in x86 assembler. So you can tell how desperate I was to be accepted by the kernel community. I was writing x86 assembler back then. Another story that you might find interesting about the development process is we started to fine grain the kernel, the SMP-ness of the kernel. And um, it was me, Ingo, and Linus. And we did some of the fine grain stuff for the uh, block layer. And Linus says, David, what networking and block driver the devices are on your system? Ingo, same. And I've got this and this. OK, as long as we get these set of drivers working, I'll push it out to my tree. And this is how things used to operate back then. You could just destroy everything to test a major upheaving change in the kernel and then spend weeks fixing the fallout so other people could use the kernel as well. That isn't happening anymore. Like You'll be hung at the, at the stake if you do that. So what's happening these days? Um, kernel ABIs are hard because we have strict requirements. Like, first of all, you have to explain the problem you're being solved. Uh, I think it was really interesting yesterday talking about what someone would say to their former self about getting involved in kernel development. And one thing that it strikes in my mind is when you come in with a patch implementing something, the last thing I want you to, to say to me in your introductory letter is, this is doing x, and it's doing it this way. That doesn't tell me anything. What I want to hear first is, I have this problem I need to solve, and this is what I am trying to accomplish. In order to accomplish this goal, I decided to implement this in this certain way. That thing at the beginning, the why, is the most important. You have my attention as long as you explain why you're making a change. If you don't do that, then I have to guess, and that you don't want me to guess. I might guess incorrectly. Another thing that's part of designing kernel APIs is you have to think about what existing facilities do we have that could also serve the same purpose and solve your problem. You'll notice that a lot of discussions uh, revolve around that point. 
assuming we get past those two initial barriers, you've defined the problem and you've considered existing interfaces, you have to look into the future like, okay, we're trying to solve this problem this way now, but in the future, might we try to use it in different ways and should we extend it and will it be extensible, et cetera. Uh, are there major holes in the design? Are there things that uh, we, should, we should take care of that could be detrimental in the future? Um, we've had a couple of situations where we've put something into the tree, it's got some traction and use in user space, and then we realize we really shouldn't have done it in the first place, and we really can't rip it out, or else we'll break all these other use cases. Um, uh, another issue is what's the security safety of it? Can it be exploited in some way? Is there some hole in the design? Is, is another way to say, is there a hole in design? Another thing that's really important, and I think it ties well into the BPF story, is will this be obsolete soon? Like, yeah, that's really important for you today, but a year, two, five years from now, will you still be trying to save, solve those problems in the same problem space and in the same way? You may not. Um, assuming all of those questions are uh, answered sufficiently and you want to go down this road, you know, it takes a long time to do a, a proper kernel change. I will admit, it is hard work. It is really difficult to get through us and is very, very difficult to move forward. But there's a reason for all this. So you have to implement it. You have to write tests for it. I'm getting pretty anal about requiring tests because we're past the point where we can just put stuff in and be like, well, if it breaks down the road, some user will find out and report it to us. We don't need to have that down the road part anymore if we just write tests up front. Uh, then you have to do the, the scariest part, which is proposing it upstream. We have to deal with uh, finicky people like me. And then you must address the feedback you get from other developers and from the maintainer. Um, and here comes the iterative cycle. You have to repeat all the steps each time you deal with feedback, and you should actually take your time with this, not post a new series every hour or every, immediately after every email you get with feedback. Don't ever do that. that makes, that's very irritating. But you have to be careful, and like maybe you had to adjust things in such a way that you have to make the tests a little bit different. So it's like this whole process you go through. Assuming you get your kernel changes upstream for the new API, enterprise level people aren't going to see this for a year and a half minimum, right? So like the, the lead time is huge. This seems like a lot of red tape and time and overhead. And in a way, if you could think about this, we define ABIs, intent, APIs intentionally as a way that confines the user to only be able to do specific things. This is in line with defining the API well and making sure there are no hole, holes or exploitable uh, me mechanisms in it, right? But you get what you, you, you've designed, and that's it. There's no real true high-level flexibility in any of this. I mean, just kind of inherent in the syscall structure of the uh, Linux kernel. Um, so the limits are always there, they're always small, and they're very precise. So what can we do about this? As a result of the way that we design kernel APIs, I, I declare that everyone who designs a kernel API is completely arrogant because you think you can decide how users can solve their problems, and you think you know better than them. We're all guilty of this, every single person in this room who's ever designed a kernel API. So don't try to weasel word your way out of this in any way. I'll call you on it. So basically, you're putting the user into a box where you say, here you are in this box. Here are the doors you can go in and out of, and here's what you're allowed to do inside the box. Um, users really don't want to be in the box. They want to be flexible. They want flexibility. They want to solve their problems, and they want to be able to adjust how they solve those problems over time in any way that they wish. Um, they may know what their problem space is today, but it can change on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. And, you know, we have to give them a way to handle that. What they really want is arbitrary policy, and they want it at the moment that they come up with the problem that they're trying to solve. Like, maximum flexibility is not just optional, it should be completely mandatory for solving their problem space. So, People want to rapidly prototype their solutions to their policy problems inside their organizations, inside their data centers, and whatever they're trying to do. Um, but we don't really give them a way to do that with the traditional way of making kernel APIs. Another thing that factors into this is that I described to you historic examples of how it was like the Wild West of software development when we initially were developing the kernel. It's not like that any now, now we have to go at a slower pace, we have to be more careful with the changes that we make, and it just takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of effort, 
changing the kernel is a big deal and time consuming, right? And it should be. We should be as careful as possible, we should test as well as possible, and we should give the highest quality kernel product at all times that we can. Um, again, reoccurring theme, this is just all eating a lot of time. So when I think about BPF and what it's like to describe BPF to people for the first time, I'm reminded of uh, the artist Picasso. He was born in Spain in 1881, and he went through several periods of his work, uh, beginning with the blue period, which is like a bit depressing, and then the red period, which is a little different. Near the end of the red period, he worked on a particular piece called Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, and it was the first example of what would be called cubism. The story behind this piece is that Picasso painted it over a period during 1907, and then he looked at it and he said, oh my god, and hid it somewhere in his, his gallery behind some, you know, uh, some uh, tarps and some, uh, you know, blankets and stuff. Only several months, like seven or eight months later, he decided to show it to uh, one of his closest art friends, and his mindset at the time was like, people are just not ready for this. And in a way, I think that people are sometimes just not ready for BPF and the implications and the scope and the capabilities that it has. Um, like when, when, if I describe BPF to someone right now that's never seen it, never heard of technology before, I just see this. I just see the words go right over their head. They're like, what you just said to me was a complete contradiction. It's not possible to do A plus B. What we have to understand is because BPF gives the maximum flexibility for solving problems, for implementing policy, for doing what you want to do right now, it gets us out of that confinement box that kernel APIs tend to put users into. It gives them a mechanism by which they can implement arbitrary policy and solve their problems in an arbitrary way over time. You have to realize that because we push all this power and flexibility into BPF, it takes pressure off the core kernel development and it makes things saner and easier over the long time period for us. And because the kernel is being developed more carefully, with more controls, with more constraints, with more care, with more precise auditing, et cetera, et cetera, this is essential because it's just going to be more and more difficult over time to make changes to the, to the kernel. And therefore, BPF provides the mechanism by which users can solve their problems more freely and uh, get what they really need. So like I said, BPF seems contradictory, and this is an example of cubism as well. Um, what people don't accept when they first hear about BPF is that it can provide maximum flexibility, i.e. let you implement whatever logic you want, yet at the same time provide a level of safety. Uh, it's a virtual machine which lets you do what you want to do inside the kernel with safe access to kernel objects via BPF helpers. And it's really the important tool uh, point to, to get out. Some, pe some people hear this and they say that this is a complete you're being a hypocrite is, that, is actually not possible, but it is. We've implemented it, and we're going to continue to improve it over time. So because of this element, I think what's really critical over time is that we educate people about BPF. If you know how BPF works, and you know why it's so awesome, because of course it is awesome, you should go out and tell your friends. Explain to them how BPF works, what kind of problems it can solve, and how it how it works, like how it actually achieves this uh, seemingly contradictory goal of maximum flexibility and safety at the same time. Um, and do it for the sake of the kernel, because over the long term, we really need something like BPF to hold us together for the rest of the ride for the Linux kernel development. And I, I would like to be able to stand up here 10 years from now and say that we succeeded. We're still developing the Linux kernel. And the reason, one of the main many reasons is that we had a mechanism by which to make kernel development more sane. And I think this is one of them. Um, I'd like to thank specifically Linus because he's held us through through such a long period of time through various kinds of tumultuous uh, situations, including the uh, Spectre meltdown situation. Um, I'd like to thank Alexi and Daniel who are maintaining VPF and doing such a fantastic job with a subsystem which is becoming almost as active and dealing with as many patches as a networking subsystem deals with. It is growing very fast. There are a lot of people interested in it, and it's not 
an easy job maintaining a subsystem that's uh, operating at that speed. I'd also like to thank Jesper because he's been doing a lot of critical, important work on uh, uh, performance of XDP and other packet-based BPF facilities, and I think that's incredibly important. And of course, I'd like to thank all the sad cats that uh, were sent to me because that's the only reason that I am here today, so I'd like to thank the sad cats too. Thank you for listening to my talk about why BPF is essential. Uh, are there any questions uh, about that particular topic first? Is there anything you would like to ask me outside of the main discussion points of these slides? Everyone's, I don't bite. Oh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I'm curious about something you've talked about uh, in other venues and that, that, touches, that um, touches on some, something that Christian mentioned as well. Um, the, kernel has a, the kernel community has a habit of uh, molding its tools around it, um, except for reviewing. And you've talked about uh, using other tools like uh, maybe... Uh, you want to talk Garrett about workflows. Them. Yeah, workflows. And that would help avoid maybe the huge email threads that become really hard to track. Uh, well, so if the kernel community was to mold a reviewing tool, what, what would it be like in your view? So here's the this, here's this story. This is an awesome topic. I like to discuss it. Um, so we had a, uh, at the kernel maintainer summit in Lisbon a couple of weeks ago, we talked basically about workflows. And that's where we created the workflows at vj.kernel.org mailing list. Um, I think one of the elements that we're, we're missing right now is automatic CI kind of stuff. Like, a lot of my time gets in, invested in undoing my tree when I find out that someone submitted something that doesn't even compile. Like, simple stuff, right? I want to be able to, so for example, I'll batch my work, I'll apply like 20, 30 patches, and then build test it, do whatever, and then push it back out to the Git tree. Wouldn't you know it, one time out of five or six, some guy in the middle doesn't build, so I gotta unwind everything, take out his patch, and reapply everything. Uh, I would love to come in every morning and have a state that said, this thing didn't even compile, and I can get it out of my patchwork queue from the beginning. So with that in mind, uh, we've been discussing various avenues to solve this problem. Yes, we could use something like GitHub or GitLab, because it's built for that, that kind of uh, facility, right? Um, but on the other hand, uh, what we actually ended up discussing at uh, Maintainer Summit is taking a tool that we have already, like Patchwork, and making it more geared towards what we're trying to do. So for example, the idea we came up with was potentially to make the Patchwork database, under, underlying database, be Git-based. So you could git pull the current state of the patchwork queue, do all your stuff, update all the states of your patches, and then push. Push could trigger stuff. Check-ins on your local tree could trigger stuff, like CIs and all, things of this nature. The other thing it's great for is that if you're offline for a while, you're going into the jungle, or you're getting on a plane on a crappy airline, you could pull out, you could actually pull the patchwork state in, do your work, disconnect it, like with Git, and then once you have internet access again, update the state everything everywhere. Uh, and I think that's really a powerful idea and one we should pursue. So it looks like that we're gonna kinda go towards towards that area. I mean, by two in the afternoon on an average busy day during the week, I still I've just finished my first pass over my, my inbox. Like I I'm not starting to do work yet, and this is not sustainable. Um, and I'm also looking into delegation, which I should have started doing earlier. Um, I mean, do you have specific things about workflows that you're interested in? Well, yeah, this, so the CI angle, that's, that's, that's a really interesting one as well. I was, I was really thinking of more the, um, the human review angle as well. Okay, I yeah, that's, that's important. So I have a lot of constraints I'm dealing with every time I'm reviewing patches, right? So first of all, does it compile? <laughs> Can we please get past that at least? Um, is this patch simple enough that I feel confident reviewing it all by myself? Is it it's small and simple enough? And I, I'll do it, I'll just do it, right? Is this an, is an area that I know that there's somebody who cares a lot about this subsystem and I should allow them the opportunity to review it and share their opinion? That puts it in a separate bucket. If I don't hear from them for a couple of days, I'll say, hey, so-and-so, would you please look at this patch? Right. And as many of you know, I really don't want patches to live, to, to queue up for more than two days. I think for someone submitting changes to a big project like ours, 
especially if they have work that's dependent upon these patches, you shouldn't have to wait for a whole week or even longer to have your changes looked at. I think that's a fundamental requirement that maintainers should strive to achieve. Maybe I'm just really aggressive with my expectation. Yeah. Been doing it for a decade. <laughs> um, so another thing I'll do, I, I, I shouldn't reveal this trick because it's being recorded, but here's something I do. If I can't get anyone to look at a patch and I want them just to resubmit it again so it shows up new in all the people's mailboxes and they might review it. I'll look for reverse Christmas tree coding style errors and just push, push back on people like that. Because you, I know that when people have a huge backlog, they just delete. They just take it out of their inbox, right? So the way to fix that is to have the submitter send the whole series again and then it's fresh in your inbox when perhaps the potential reviewers would be less busy and would be less overloaded and therefore it's more likely to get reviewed in a reasonable amount of time. I mean, just letting it sit there, nothing happens. It just rots. And it just, I, like, I, could, I look at the dates and I'm like, that's more than two days, we need to work on this. Um, so on a case-by-case -case basis, I look at the situation and try to figure out how to move things forward in an efficient way. Reviewing is the primary uh, choke point when it comes down to it, especially for non-trivial changes. Another thing I've tried to do is we have a set of network driver reviewers that we have two at a time on a week on a rotating people pick when they want to do. We have a Google calendar for it. And this helps for the situation where network drivers have a lot of changes that are just like, oh, program this register correctly, or this is the wrong bit in this descriptor, let's fix, fix the definition, or here's a new ID for an advice. These are trivial. These changes to the device, uh, device drivers don't affect anyone else in the world, really, besides people who use those specific devices. It's really contained and constrained, easy to review. However, we have these other changes that are along the lines of, oh, let's export this aspect of the device to the user in this way, and I want people to review those as if they were core kernel changes because they have implications for the user experience and how Linux networking looks to people who actually use Linux. So that's important. So that's what the driver review committee is for, for those kind of changes. So we're trying to do things to distribute the work, to delegate, to make things more easy, and hopefully we can make tooling changes which can increase the quality and the efficiency of our work as well. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, that raises a bunch more, but we can take it offline. Okay, cool. It's okay. Up. Uh, whoa. All right, back to the original topic. Um, complaint I hear about BPF, which may or may not align with my own opinion, is that <laughs> rather than letting users out of this, the, the syscall box, we're moving it to a new level of, of lower level BPF hooks and helper functions. Exactly. It's still essentially a system call interface that is now done at a level that way fewer people understand and is going to get a lot less review. And if we were aiming towards creating an uncontrolled mess that we will not be able to maintain in the future. That's a um, valid criticism. I, I take it that's not your um, point of view, and I guess I'd ask why it is that that's not where we're headed. The wall between not having that happen and that happening is making sure we have high quality review for any BPF helper that's ever implemented in the kernel, so that, that's basically a, a, fixed, a, a strong requirement, right? Um, maybe we can formalize something about the review for BPF helpers because they have such implica Im Im uh, implications. If, if you look at how a traditional system call would be designed and written and implemented, like, like the PIDFS stuff, PIDFD stuff, you could, you could say, the user, we've decided that the user wants to solve this particular task and we write code that accesses kernel objects and implements the task that they're trying to perform. BPF way is the user explicitly writes the piece of code that performs the task they want to perform and we give them access to the objects in a, in a controlled manner at some point. So, the focal point again it, are these helpers and therefore how safe are they implemented? Can we formally verify that we're not letting people in, access kernel objects in incorrect ways? Reference count leaks, access to memory they shouldn't access, et cetera, et cetera. So it is a valid concern and we need to be careful. So this reminds me of another ar ar argument which you probably have heard me make. A lot of people say BPF is so unsafe, people could do arbitrary things with BPF, just, there's some bug in BPF. It's like, if there's some bug in the kernel memory management, the user could muck up the system too. I mean, it's 
quality of the code is the quality of the code. One argument I will accept is that the reason it's different is because the process management co and uh, uh, memory management of the Linux kernel for user process is more established. It's, we've been working on it for decades, and BPF is not at that point yet. It's not as mature yet. So I think those are the variables that go on to the decision making and the thinking about this topic. Um, just to go on with this, and this is actually something I've been thinking about some time because of uh, the tra way tracing works too. And I almost see like BPF is a great thing to do and I, I agree with a lot of what you're saying, but then I'm thinking, looking at um, another situation that has happened recently and was talked about earlier uh, yesterday about some, another group of people that said, oh, we can make performance really great this way and do all this and all this. Then suddenly we have this thing called a side channel and you do an attack. Right. And I'm wondering, you know, the more that we give and the more that we allow users to do and we have all these protections in there, now you might be able to figure out timings. You might be able to figure out, there might be another, we're get, opening up, we're opening up the kernel quite drastically. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, yes, we could have all this perfect, but then someone else could attack with another way we never thought about. Exactly. So they, this, this is another recurring theme, which is like, uh, what is the relationship with BPF and side channel attacks, right? That's the basic uh, issue. And I like to say like, well, at least with the, if, you, if we fix the verifier, we can have it detect patterns exploiting side channel-ish things, right? Like we know if the, if the program's doing this in the code, it's exploiting the side channel and therefore reject the loading of the program. However, the counter argument to this is in a lot of situations, this is like letting, this is like locking the door after the bad guys, the burglars in your house already. So there would be con this constant battle between us discovering side channel attacks and putting the stop gaps in the verifier, which is what we have to do with the core kernel code anyways. I mean, if, if we want, we can have like a super safe mode for BPF that inserts S fences everywhere or something ridiculous like that. Like if people like, performance is second, second uh, uh, concern to, to that and maybe we should do things that way. But yeah, that is a very important concern. I agree with you. Uh, one of the things I've been oh, uh, thinking about, I guess, uh, and I guess a lot of people too, and it came up on a mailing list recently yeah. is, uh, and I'm sorry for bringing this up, unprivileged eBPF uh, again. So eBPF is obviously a great tool uh, but we have, I mean, by now we have patterns in the kernel where we have user namespaces, we have hit namespaces where you want to use that basically are designed um, with syscalls. You have the ability that a lot of the features that you implement, the restrictions, you can make the restrictions tight enough that it's safe to delegate to unprivileged users. Right. It's really important. And uh, the thing is, all the cool new features that BPF has and will have, they probably won't be available to unprivileged users as far as I understood uh, Daniel last time. Uh, Do you think it's question. safe to allow memory management to user processes? <sighs> to delegate user uh, memory management to user processes? Overall, we kind of, we already do, right? And so maybe at some point, BPF will be mature enough that you would feel comfortable doing that as well. It's just another piece of technology. Right, but the, the <laughs> message was that's never going to that's never going to happen. And I think a lot of people are very scared because of the manner in which all these new side channel exploits are coming out. It's it's kind of like uh, it almost feels like Pandora, Pandora's box is extremely open. And where is this going to go? And how, how, will we ever be able to surmount this to the point where we'd feel safe allowing users to do BPF stuff? So yeah, that is an important concern. It, it brings more, it gets more interesting b because right now we're at a point where we have, uh, we were thinking about LSMs and BPF, right? Now exactly. We have, now we have two competing. Uh, yeah, they discussed that uh, plumbers at the micro conference, yeah. yes. So yeah, it's, it's an interesting area. I, I at some point would like to see user BPF programs that would be make things really interesting. Um, and I didn't even, in my talk, I didn't even get into tracing and performance analysis and what BPF allows in that domain. I mean, it was just, and that's just like a whole nother explosive area that we've moved forward in a significant way because of this technology. And I think that's, it's important to make a point to, to bring that out. But yes, I, I understand the point you're trying to make about user, users using BPF directly. It's an interesting problem space. So one thing I'm wondering in the context of BPF is, and 
uh, not only in the area of PPF, I'm, I'm looking into that in other areas as well, is should we finally start bringing really academic people in and look at formal verification? So there are people formal, who have... Who have not uh, verification in the sense we think verification works because that's a... So the verifier, the verifier is the area where the ad academics really want to do stuff. However, from what we've seen so far, people come up with formal methods to make the verifier more easily verifiable, more correct, yet it takes like half an hour to compile your BPF program when you load it into the, to the verifier. So it's not very practical solutions coming thus far. Mm, yes, I agree that it's not very practical, but uh, I'm more looking at the uh, at the technology itself, so so can we make sure that people who understand really formal verification are involved in formally verifying the verifier, <laughs> not having a formally correct, not doing the, the the verification of the user program in a way which takes two hours to compile. But I'll I'll answer your question with a question. What do you think is more complicated, the BPF verifier or RCU? Uh, uh. <laughs> no answer. <laughs> no, I, I know what you mean. Let me make a synchronized RCU call. OK, what is your answer now? No. OK, uh, you don't know. Exactly. So. No, but, uh, no, no but what I'm saying is think, think about, let's, let's say for argument's sake, they're equally complicated yes. in some abstract sense. It's taken him more than a decade to formally verify the various RC mechanisms, and he has to he has to modify the verification tools that out, exist out there by researchers in order to try and solve I know. RC. This is not a simple problem space, even for someone who is as dedicated as Paul is. Uh, I totally agree. We, but, but we can't ignore the problem. We should do something. I agree with that. Right. It's a, I mean, on the other hand, if you look at what the people have done with the memory model, if we wouldn't have a formalized memory model. We couldn't do things what we do now. Exactly. We couldn't define things, and therefore we could not take the steps that we've taken. Since I mean, then. Uh, whatever. Spark and other architectures would have been broken. Exactly. Uh, and nobody would have figured out why. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, there's, 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 a, there's, a, there's this balance between, yeah, it, it's complicated because researchers are complicated. And they tend to live in an ivory tower, uh, but uh, what we have to find a way to get people interested in it. That's the other thing, and I can't even get people to compile test their patches that they send to the mailing list. So yeah. we need to we need to Don't walk tell me. we need to walk before we run. Actually, that's some that's another point I like to make about workflows and being a contributor and doing new things with the kernel. Learn to walk before you run. Submit easy stuff before you work on non-trivial projects. I know a lot of people get in a situation where they're like, I have to solve this major problem, or my boss has told me to solve this major problem. And you go in there and try to write a non-trivial piece of code that is going to be <coughs> difficult to review, even for skilled people. And they don't know who you are, and they don't know if you're trustworthy, and they don't know how well you are as a kernel developer. Submit simple changes first. You find small bug fixes around the tree while you're working on your new feature. Submit those all by themselves, because this is how you get experience, and this is how we become more familiar with you as a contributor, and that is absolutely essential. I look at patches differently based upon who's submitting them and how much experience I have for that developer, 100%. I will not lie that in certain situations with certain developers, I trust them to the point where I will not look at their code, because I know they'll come and fix whatever they broke, always. 100%. He, he's for, I'll give you the microphone after him. So as I understood you, um, the, one of the key requirements for BPF being awesome is that the BPF programs are properly reviewed. And I would agree to that. that However, so having, this is a, se this is, this, this is a separate problem space. I think what's important is that the infrastructure is strong and tight formally verified at some point, and that we're smart about how we pick the BPF helpers. That doesn't say that I, we shouldn't allow users to shoot themselves in the foot from their own personal perspective. So this is a whole other story, and another discussion is about the BPF program infrastructure. Like, 
it's like a whole other world of programs, right? It's like almost separate from the kernel. Like it's like a, it's a, it's its own problem space, right? It's it's completely separate. I think. If we provide the tools, how will people use them? Yeah, because getting review is one of the pain points we currently have. On the right. Kernel. I mean, we don't have true libraries yet. That's something we would like to do in the future. So people recode everything, like packet parsing and things of this nature, over and over and over again. So that's kind of blocking having a true good ecosystem for BPF programming, in my opinion. Lift your hand so he knows where to go. Thanks. Uh, so I, I wanted to, uh, to go back to your point about uh, walking before you run. So I agree, first of all. Second, but, but, but with that, you know, if there are people who make changes to the kernel to solve a particular problem at a particular time, and they have the horrible, nasty, you know, hackish patches somewhere. Uh, actually, I also, like, want, so, you know, e e e e uh, for the purpose of explaining the problem, if somebody sends something like that to me with, like, with a uh, with, with message that, you know, I have this problem, and this is what I do to solve it, locally here, that it helps too. It is not like- It's information. It's information, yeah. So if you have, if you have something like that and you are not like, you know, ashamed of it entirely and want to, <laughs> you know, and-, and, and please, it, please put RFC in the subject. Right. That's great, that helps me because when I'm overloaded, I know I can delete all the RFC stuff and other people can hopefully look at it when I'm really overloaded. Yeah, RFC it's important. Or, you know, bug, bug report, something like that, but you know, the changes, if I see what changes are made to, to make this work, then this helps too, because it's like, yeah. One thing that's really hard for technical people is to say, I'm not sure I know what I'm doing right now. Yeah. <laughs> yes, so a lot of times people will submit a change matter-of-factly, like, I'm sure this is, this is the solution to the problem when that's not necessarily the case. No, 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 only when I'm overloaded. Only when I'm overloaded. No, but, I and mean, I'll apply every patch from somebody without looking at it. I mean, you had, uh, you had a, a very important uh, point on one of your slides where you said, look at the problem and not at the symptom. And exactly. That's a tendency uh, people just have. Oh, I know where the bug is. Paper over it and go away because and that's a problem which is not caused by the engineers, it's caused by management. It's caused by management, but also, let's, this gets back to the thing I just said, I mean, lack, lack of domain knowledge. It's lack of domain knowledge, and it's, but it's massively caused, and I hope with that, um, in my area where I'm reviewing patches, where I can exactly see, oh, this person got tasked to do this in two weeks, and then tick the checkbox for the manager. Exactly. And, and then the you go back and say, no, this is, doesn't work, and you get an answer. This is not in the scope of my project. <laughs> and I tell them, it's now. It, it is now, <laughs> right? Uh, so one thing, the, the worst to me, is that if you pressure me really hard to uh, integrate your changes, and I finally am personally pretty much convinced, and I put it in, and then you disappear. That is absolutely the worst, and this happened. There was a set of, the initial set of multi-path routing changes was done by IBM Germany, and the guy pressured me really friggin' hard for like five months. The moment I put the patches in, they were, had all kinds of memory management issues and leaks and stuff, he wouldn't respond to any emails from me after that point. He checked his box with his department, with his manager, and he was like, I'm not interested in this anymore. You can't do that, and I will revert your code just like I reverted his code. Uh, microphone. Uh, there's, there was someone who had their hand up before yeah. you. Go. We'll get you, we'll get to you, we'll get to you. So it seems to me that um, the flexibility of eBPF uh, marks a transition for the user kernel ABI where it's gone from sort of a, well it will go from a predetermined nature where we think really hard about it to a more flexible nature where the exact uh, exposure of kernel behavior uh, to user space is not it's more about strict determined. object ask access, like so safe object access. So my worry, I suppose, is how on earth do we test this new emergent ABI, and how do you how do we manage regressions? Well, the BPF scared. actually BPF as a subsystem 
is the best at having tests and regression tests that is run before every check into their tree. So let's start, let's start with that before we say, oh, how can we regression test this? Well, we are regression testing it. The scope is huge. Mm -hmm. I think that's what it did. As much, the, the, the level to which it allows you to do interesting things is the level to which it allows you to do perhaps things we don't want people to do. And in, in word, testing is more difficult. So I totally agree with you on that. Testing is absolutely essential for BPF. It feels to me that we may get more you know, users using things in ways that we didn't expect, which is cool. But also then, if, if we change that behavior accidentally, we didn't realize we were. We didn't understand that. yet. So, um, that's really funny because one problem we had for a long time was we had no idea how people would use BPF, mm -hmm. and it was hard to decide what new features to implement and where to uh, place our resources in a prioritized manner. But now that we start seeing people gradually we say, oh, I'm doing this, this doesn't work, how, how can I solve this kind of problem with BPF, we're getting that information. And that ties into the do not break things unintentionally, I think. Uh, Since you mentioned that you are overloaded with patches at times, and like there are RFC patches which you delete out of the, like immediately at that point, is there some way to like pre-sort those patches so you don't have no, to no, no, do no. that okay. at all? No, 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 okay, hey. People are reading very, very deeply into the, some of the things I've said. Well, specifically, I was curious whether it's possible to kind of like train some neural network maybe to do like pre-review of the patches so that the maintainers don't have to First do of all, I don't think you want to clone my brain into a neural network. I strongly do not advise that. Uh, secondly, I always reply to the patch if it's not an RFC and say, I'm doing this with the patch for your information. And even if you miss that email, you can look at the state of the patch and patchwork and see what, what state I changed it to if, if it's not in under review state, which means we're still looking at it and it's, it might be applied. So. I just delete RFC stuff when I'm truly overloaded because it's not stuff I should actively put into the tree, by definition. So that, that's what that's all about. So training neural network stuff, I'm more interested in seeing sophisticated testing for that kind of logic like syscaller and things of that nature and just, just get the patches build tested so fast that the maintainers know ahead of time that the thing doesn't build and they shouldn't even look at the patch anymore. Like, I think that's the first order problem. And maybe patch review AI, mm, I don't, don't think. Well, maybe you just want to run something like check patch and reject immediately all the patches which are but not even But the kernel build bot should be doing that crap already too. Like, it can do it. Um, two things, one for CI. Um, I think two years ago I proposed that we should have a bot where we can send our patches, and that bot is going to run CI. The, ro the robot should look at the milling list and do all the CI stuff automatically. Like, it really should. And it, and it kind of references the... Yeah, and it's really slow now. So, it, but also this reminds me about how Sysbot, you can put a tag in there and tell Sysbot, hey, retest bug XYZ, because this, I think, will fix it. No, but what I mean is, you as a user, you have a way to send your mail to a bot, uh, oh, beforehand, beforehand. Yes. And this bot is private, so you, you don't feel the same of sending something in public when it's going to explode very in, in something very simple. So like that, like, like it would be interesting to control the resources consumed by that kind of facility. But it is interesting that you, if you could send things to BuildBot automatically. But the, the other thing is regarding EBPF, uh, if we really trust the verifier, why don't we, uh, for the part of our drivers, that doesn't have memory access, that doesn't access the hardware, why don't we just run the verifier on, uh, on the code that we generate? Um, um, so you write your code, and during build time, you convert it into VPF, you pass it to the, to, to the verifier, and the verifier will tell you if your driver is going to do something stupid. If it's not so you mean stupid. implement the entire driver in BPF? Yeah, and almost. So there's, so, so okay, recently there was a proposal to allow modules to be written in Rust or whatever. BPF is another competing idea as well, and that could be interesting for very simple pro drivers that don't have, you know, extreme performance constraints for their fast pass. Like, you know, we wouldn't want to do like the Mellanox Ethernet driver in BPF for obvious reasons. So for a certain problem space, that would be very interesting. I agree with you. Yeah, I understand. I understand. It's like you could say these drivers went to the verifier, and we could therefore conclude X, Y, Z about these drivers. That's cool. Last uh, okay, last question, please. Last question. Um, 
I'm having some doubts regarding uh, the concept of having a, a private build bot or something like this just because uh, I think that most of the uh, non-compiling patches that you receive are, are simply not being tested and uh, they come from people who don't respect any process. I so totally agree with you. I've seen a lot of situations where people implement some patch against like 3.14 or something crazy like that. They forward port it to the current kernel and don't even build test it. And then I say, it doesn't build, you've got to be kidding me. Then they resubmit it after they, ha ha, I build tested it. I say, how did you functionally test this with the current kernel? And they're like, oh, I didn't. So yes, I totally agree with you. There are a lot of patches that would be in that state and are troublesome, extremely troublesome. All right, thank you very much for being such an amazing audience. <laughs>